our treasure, which is money. And we give a portion of that back to you this time, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would multiply it and help us to continue to connect the Claymont community and beyond to Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be God. So we're starting a new series today. And actually this series is going to run in May and June. Because we have some specialty Sundays like Pentecost Sunday and Ascension Sunday that we want to celebrate as well. This series is called The Signs of the Times. And what is a series of messages on the signs of the times going to be about, you might wonder? Well, the first thing, it is an opportunity to see a parallel between Bible and Bible prophecy in particular as compared to the headline news that we see daily or is talked about at work or wherever we may be going. People are wondering, wondering what in the world is going on, aren't they? This is not in any way an effort to exaggerate or dramatize current events or to assign a time for Jesus' return because that would just be foolish to try to do that. Nor are these messages trying to make everything in, that's happening in our world into a sign of the times of Jesus' return. So most importantly and positively, it is an opportunity to stir our hearts and minds to get ready for the blessed hope our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to gloriously appear one day soon. Amen? Amen. Are you excited? Yes. I'm excited, and I'm excited about this series of messages because our magnificent and lovely and beloved bridegroom is coming for his bride. Who's that? Us, the church, the building? Nah, you people, the church's people. I have some friends here that I've been teaching about the church, some young people, and I love it. Every time I ask them, what is the church? They always tell me it's the people, and I'm so proud of these students of the Bible. The bridegroom is coming back for the family of God, and when Jesus comes back, we want to be found in faith. We want to be found waiting and watching for our bridegroom to return. And may we also be found living a holy and Christian life like God our Father wants us to through faith in Jesus Christ. So, the question, will you be found living a sacrificial life of love and mercy for God and for others and for others that God puts in your path? Or will you be like the Pharisees, following a set of moralistic and religious rules? Very self-righteous. I'm saved. I'm good. I know God. I know the blood of Jesus covers me. I live, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm like the older brother and the prodigal son. Dad, why didn't you throw me a party? I'm such a good Christian. We don't want to be found like the older brother. We want to be found more like the younger son in that prodigal story where he said, Father, in heaven, forgive me for I have sinned against you and my family. Please, humility is a very important part of our walk as Christians. The religious leaders were very self-righteous and lukewarm to the things of God. And now is the time for us to take seriously that Jesus is coming back, just as the Word of God says he will. The Bible signs of the times are found in Bible prophecy, and they're visible events, sometimes miraculous, or otherwise you can't explain how it happened, but the point, that point, that sign points to something beyond the sign itself. Signs are what we are to look for and pay attention to, just like when you're driving your car. Hello, if you're not watching the signs, you're going to find yourself in danger in your life and the life of the other of others. These signs from God are all found where? In God's Word. Very good, class. In God's Word. God's word, God's holy word that is perfect and righteous, and it's healing. Speaking of healing, we're having a healing service tonight. Prayer and healing, 6.30 down in the sanctuary. You come expecting a miracle. God is at work, and God answers the fervent prayers of his people that are living rightly for him. And we expect answers. And if you need, if your heart is hurting, it's not just for physical healing, it's emotional healing. Are you living in an abusive situation? Are you living 
but you're not really living, you're, you're hurting, come, be prayed over. There is power in prayer. There's power in God's word that tells us that if you're sick, that you come and let the elders of the church pray over you. God's word is powerful, and it delivers us from evil. It's restoring, and it's fulfilling, and comforting. And we need God's word for teacher and training, and that's why, why for teaching and training, that's why I put in a plug for life groups. We do not have a vibrant Sunday school here. We have a vibrant class for Sunday school, just one. Folks, you need to get out and go to a life group, because God wants you to learn. If you're not learning, you're not growing, and if you're not growing, you're putting yourself in a dangerous place. God's word will empower you and make you brave and courageous and give you victory. And God's word is historical, and I'd like to show you that today. One author of the Bible, one author calls the Holy Bible the greatest library ever. Do you have the greatest library ever in your home? Someone told me the other day they have like 20 Bibles in their home. I would love to know how many of them are read. Jesus used the term, the sign of the times, to verify his first coming as he fulfilled Old Testament prophecies and performed miracles that pointed right to himself because he was Messiah. Hundreds, hundreds of specific prophecies have already been literally fulfilled and many of them in relation to the first coming of Jesus. Listen to some of these. Tell me if you hear, to hear these at Christmas time. Have you ever heard that Jesus was born of a woman? Yes, he was born of a woman. And that was prophesied in, Gen in, Gen in the book of Genesis 3.15. Do you know that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, a descendant of the house of David? Did you know that? Yes. Yeah, we hear that every year read in our, in, our, in our Christmas programs that we have here in services. He was born of a virgin. You know that one. I'm going to keep going. Called Emmanuel. God with us. Born in Bethlehem. He was to be worshipped and given gifts by the wise men. All of this prophesied hundreds of years before his birth. He would live in Egypt. He would speak in parables. He was a mighty healer. And he's still healing us today because he's God. Same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He was a miracle worker, and the miracle workers weren't recognized by the Jews as they should have been. They said, ba Beelzebub is in him. The devil's in him doing those miracles. What an insult to our Savior, don't you think? Down with the devil, up with Messiah. The religious leaders and the Jews rejected Jesus. He did have his triumphal entry. On Palm Sunday, as we celebrated into Jerusalem, was predicted and prophesied. And in Jesus' passion alone, Thursday through Friday, when Jesus was placed in the grave, 22 prophecies from the Old Testament were fulfilled in those two days' events. And in the final, and in the final three days, where he was in the tomb, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and his seat at the right hand of the Father God were all predicted. Pre predicted and prophesied in the Old Testament. And that's just the tip of the iceberg I'm sharing with you here. Yet, how many Jews were blind to Jesus' first coming? They were blind to the prophecies of their scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. So many that enough of them had him murdered. The crowd that cried in Jerusalem, crucify him, crucify him. We don't know how many, but so many that they got their way and they crucified our Savior. <coughs> Sadly, the same is true today. Many followers of Jesus and churchgoers are blind to Jesus and his prophecies that have been, been given to us in this amazing book to know the signs of the times for his second glorious appearing. For these series of messages, Pastor John and I are using the Bible as our textbook, as every Christian should use this for their textbook of living. We have also read, people are asking, is this the end by Dr. David Jeremiah? If you're interested in any of these books, I highly recommend them. Tim LaHaye, who wrote the Left Behind series, Charting the End Times. This has a ton of really good charts and pictures, ladies and gentlemen. It makes it an easy read and easy to understand. 
And finally, a golden one here is called The End by Mark Hitchcock. He is quoted, Mark is quoted in these other books because this is like, he says, a complete overview of Bible prophecy and the end of days. Are you getting excited about studying this with me? Because honestly, in your bulletin, I wrote a really lovely note to each and every one of you of how to study outside of worship, um, telling you where to read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the um, accounts of the end. And today's is coming from um, Matthew 24. Okay, so let us begin by defining prophecy. Prophecy is history written in advance. It is a message that a prophet of God conveys to the people. It is an infallible message spoken or written by these people, prophets, that God has chosen for them to do just that. It's not only a prediction, it includes any aspect of God's revelation to man as recorded in the Word of God. It is God-breathed, God-inspired, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yay, God! Amen. Amen. Our study on the end times is a study of predictive prophecy, that which is still in the future yet to be fulfilled throughout his story, throughout God's story called history, get it, his story, I love that, some genius thought of that, God has chosen men and women to be prophets, Joe, thank you, unfortunately prophets get a bad rap a lot of times, they have suffered ridicule, they've been tortured and even died. And their message has been ridiculed and, and denied, and many efforts to silence it or wipe it out completely. A prophet or a prophetess is a spokesperson for God, a mouthpiece for God. Many considered them strange, wearing strange clothing, eating strange food, living strange lives like John the Baptist. They're called fanatics, or lunatics, or crazy old people. What an insult to us old people, huh? <laughs> crazy old people! No way! We're not crazy. We're crazy about Jesus, that's about it. Amen. Amen. Prophets were also called a man of God, woman of God, a servant of God, or a seer. S-E-E-R. One who sees and receives divine revelation from God. <coughs> As a seer, the prophet knows what to say. God gives him the input, and the prophet is the channel for the output. There are some 31,000 verses in the Bible. A little over that. The exact numbers in Mark Hitchcock's book. As for the amount of prophetic verses, proportionately, it is significant. 27% of the Bible is prophecy. That is a major theme in the Bible, and it's worthy of us studying. In the Old Testament, 1,239 prophetic verses are found, and in the New Testament, 1,711. Of the 333 prophecies concerning Jesus, 109 were fulfilled by his first coming. That leaves a grand total of 224 yet-to-be-fulfilled prophecies for his second coming. Jesus himself said 22 times in verses he was prophesying about his second coming. And there are 1,500 Old Testament passages that refer to his second coming. Friends, there's a lot to study about the second coming, isn't there? One of the most significant and major books of prophecy is the book of Daniel. Daniel is the most powerful prophet of the Bible, or so I have, been, I have read. He is a lifelong prophet of God who lived during the Babylonian captivity when the Jews were taken to Babylon for 70 years. Religious experts who are skeptics have accused the book of Daniel of being a forgery. The experts say it is absolutely impossible for Daniel to have written what he wrote in 600 B.C., and that it had to have been written four to five hundred years 
later in order for Daniel to know the accuracy and the details of what he wrote. Daniel's skeptics attribute the book of Daniel closer to the time when Jesus was born during the Maccabean period. That's the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the book of Daniel, in chapter 2, Daniel correctly prophesied the four major civilizations that would exist. The Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. These kingdoms would extend from the 6th century that Daniel lived in all the way up until the time of Jesus' birth and beyond. Equally important was Daniel's prophecy in chapter 7 known as the 70 weeks. I've been hearing about the 70 weeks for so long, and now, thank you, Jesus, I think I got it. I've heard these things, and these things in Daniel, and these things in Ezekiel, and this in Isaiah, and this in the New Testament, but it all comes together in God's Word to be the complete big picture of what God was doing, letting us know He is God, He is in control. And he gives us these signs to help us be prepared for what we need to do living when we are living, in the times that we are living. The kingdoms did extend. The Roman Empire extended all, all, all through Jesus' lifetime. And then it's going to actually reappear again during the seven years of the tribulation. Did you know that? I did not know that. I've heard something about that. But equally important in Daniel's prophecy in chapter 7, 7 was, no, I'm sorry, equally important was Daniel's prof prophecy that was known as the seven weeks of Daniel, that the, during the seventh, 70th week, that would be the year, years of the Great Tribulation. So Daniel has prophesied all the way through to the Great Tribulation itself and the return of Jesus Christ. When Anna and Simeon were waiting in the temple for Jesus to be born. Do you remember that Christmas story? They waited there. They were waiting there. Anna was an old woman. She had been there for decades. But because of Daniel's writings in the book of Daniel, there was an idea, a, a close estimate, if not very close, of when Jesus would be born. That's why they were waiting, because they knew the scriptures. And the Babylonians, the the astrologers called the wise men in Babylon, Daniel living in Babylon taught them about the star that would show that the Messiah had been born. He taught them the very prophecies he was writing down at the exact same time. And that's why the men in the east knew that Messiah was going to be born and they looked for a star to come to Israel to bring him gifts and worship him. None of this is a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen. It is a God incident, incident that he has orchestrated all these signs for the first coming of Jesus and for the second coming of Jesus. And now for our scripture passage today, known as the Olivet Discourse, because it takes place on the Mount of Olives, which is just to the east of the city of Jerusalem. In the text today, the disciples have received a prophetic message or word sign from Jesus himself. Jesus is king and Jesus is prophet. As the disciples are leaving the temple area in Jerusalem with Jesus on their way to the Garden of Olives, the disciples call Jesus to the temple. I want you to imagine walking right down here and you're a stranger in Claymont and you see Atonement Church. Oh my gosh! This church is beautiful. Can you believe the stonework? Oh my gosh, and look at that cross. It looks like they just got that cross repaired and made a lot of money and it's in such good shape. Thank you, Atonement Church. And look at the stained glass windows. And oh my gosh, the landscaping is so beautiful. They, people admire this church and that's what the disciples were doing with Jesus, saying, look Jesus, look at these stones. I mean, these stones were ginormous. Like the ones they used to build the pyramids in Egypt, those type of stones are what built the temple. It was the pride and joy of Jerusalem. And it had multi-colors in the stones. And it was, it was um, just a splendid building. Uh, what I wrote, read was that porches 
and courts and entranceways and all the other structures that were intricately made to make this absolutely, I can't even imagine. Has anyone here been to Israel and seen it? Have you seen the temple? Who else has seen the temple? Oh, you blessed and prosperous, fortunate, spiritually fortunate people that have been to Israel. Praise God. Is it was it magnificent? Very magnificent. And the disciples are telling Jesus about it. But Jesus didn't respond quite the way they probably expected because Jesus said he was disappointed because that he called it a den of thieves. It was supposed to be his father's house of prayer, but because what it was using, used for was for a den of thieves to, to sell and to make money off of people. Now, Hatoman Church is truly a house of prayer, isn't it? Amen. Amen. And a beautiful faith community that loves and serves Amen. Jesus with all their heart. Amen. So Jesus gave the disciples this prophecy. He said, truly, 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 verily, I tell you the truth. I think it's going to be truthful, isn't it? Not one stone here will be left on top of another. Every one will be thrown down. My gosh, can you imagine their reaction? But yet, 40 years later, in A.D. 30, A.D. 70, the Romans destroyed the precious temple that Jesus had prophesied about. Titus, the Roman general, captured the city in order to have Jerusalem leveled to the ground. And thanks be to God that Jesus Christ had warned the Christians that that day was coming and for them to flee, to flee from the city of Jerusalem. So the Christians left, but millions of Jews remained in, in Jerusalem, a million or more than that, and they were, they were all destroyed. Not all, but most. It is recorded that Titus the general had the power and he did try to preserve at least a portion of the temple. But the Roman soldiers under him had such deep-seated hate and resented the Jews that the historical writ record written by Josephus tells us that those Roman soldiers set the temple on fire. And even when they were ordered by Titus to put the fire out, they totally refused. In verse 2, Jesus had said, Not one stone will be left on top of another, and every one was thrown down, and that was literally fulfilled in AD 70. And finally, verse 3 is going to be the subject of the coming messages on the end times. Jesus is now sitting in the Garden of Olives, and his four disciples, James and Andrew and John and Peter, came to Jesus with three questions. Number one, when shall these things happen? Number two, what shall the sign of Jesus' coming? What shall be the sign of Jesus' coming? And number three, what shall be the sign of the end of the world? So over these weeks that we're going to be studying, <coughs> we will use scripture, and I highly encourage you to read Matthew 24, which is the Olivet Discourse, the conversation, and then go and look up in, Math, in Mark and Luke and John. And then look into Daniel. Read the book of Daniel. And get yourself a couple good commentaries, online or in a, in a hard copy. And, and, and really research it. Dig! There's a pearl of great price in all of this for you. Let us allow the Holy Spirit to make the Word, God's Word, known to us about Bible prophecy and about what we can expect so that we can share this when our friends, when anyone asks us a question, we will be ready with an answer. The things mentioned in chapter 24 are all part of the sign that is going to be the sign for the end of the world. For this study, let us get to a place where we're not like the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders of the first century just completely missed that Jesus was Messiah. May our faith and the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us 
Give us a heart dedicated not only to Jesus, but to Jesus, the living word, the written word of God. We are Christians. The textbook is our textbook for life. We need to be reading. We are the church, and the church is not a building. Just imagine if the Jews were as committed and devoted to, to, to God and to Jesus as Messiah as they were to the temple, we would we'd be living a different life today. Brothers and sisters in Christ, yes. Jesus is coming, and you better get ready. Joe, that's my cue for a great song. <laughs>
we have got to know more about the Word of God than we do about a sports team or anything else. And I love, I love baseball. I know it's cerebral, but I really like it because I can follow it easier than some of those other sports. But my friends, look, why don't you be a, a, a passionate, on fire follower of Jesus Christ? Because our world is the way it is now because too many Christians are lukewarm. If you can't take a stand for Jesus and talk to God about it, because what we believe is coming out of our heart. And if we have problems with our behavior, we probably have a heart problem. But we need to love God more and live for God. So as we study these end times, I hope that the Holy Spirit, I know the Holy Spirit, I'm speaking it as though it is. The Holy Spirit is going to move the branch and move Hope Church and move Atonement Traditional Service to be better than ever for the glory and praise and honor of God. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for everything that's happened here today. And thank you, God. Thank you for this study that... We need to know, Lord. We need to understand. We don't want to be foolish. We don't want to be left behind. And not only that, Lord, we want to be doing the things that you want us to be doing as we prepare to receive you, Jesus, our beautiful bridegroom, and that you will find this bride here at these churches doing the things we should be doing and ready and waiting for your return. For we pray in Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. Amen. Before we leave this place, can we sing one more song? Maybe two more songs?
know, Pastor Amy taught us that, uh, of course, many of us know there is a temple over in Jerusalem. There was a temple. And this is a temple. It's over in church. It's a temple. Yeah. Yeah. But also, we, our bodies, our human bodies, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Church, let's not forget that. And let's feed that temple. And let's learn about the same time. Let's look for those signs and wonders. And we're going to learn all about that in the next uh, seven or eight weeks. So go from this place knowing that you are loved, you are wanted, and you are needed. Amen, church? Amen.